The wind was howling, snow slamming the canvas. The thermometer read minus 20 degrees. And here's the kicker, no firewood, not a single stick, just a tippy, the clothes on our backs, and seven old tricks we dug up from history and hard living. Now I know what you're thinking. How in the world do you stay alive in a tent like this? When the cold cuts like a knife, the Sioux and the Cree, they knew a thing or two about nights like this. Trappers, frontiersmen, they didn't always have a roaring fire. Sometimes all they had was their wits. So we put those wits to the test. Seven methods. Some worked better than we ever imagined. Others nearly froze us stiff. And here's the truth, fellas. If even one of these tricks failed, you felt the cold shoot straight through your bones. Stick around because by the end of this night, we learned which of these ancient survival hacks could keep a man breathing when winter itself tries to bury you. We set up the teepee, the old way, long poles crossed canvas, stretched tight, snow already piling up at the base. It looked like something out of another century, and that was the point. We wanted to test ourselves the way our grandfathers might have. No firewood, no roaring blaze, just hide canvas and grit. Out here, the cold doesn't care who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a rookie camper or a seasoned hunter. At minus 20, every breath feels like knives in your lungs. You guys who've hunted elk in late December or tried sleeping in a frozen deer camp, you know exactly what I mean. That chill doesn't just nip your nose, it crawls down your spine. The Sioux and Cree once slept in tippies like this. The French trappers, the frontiersmen, they all faced nights without fire. And they survived by tricks most of us have nearly forgotten. So here we were. No wood, no flame. Just us. A tippy buried in snow. And the challenge of outsmarting the cold the way men did a hundred winters ago. First problem we faced. The floor. Cold doesn't just come from the wind. It seeps up from the ground slow and steady, like an enemy crawling under the tent walls. So the first trick was old as the hills dig a cold pit right inside the teepee, a shallow trench just a couple feet down. Let the heavy air, the freezing stuff, sink into that hole instead of creeping into your bones. Sounds simple, right? But the difference was shocking, sitting just two, three feet higher than the pit. Suddenly, you're out of that river of cold air. You can actually breathe without your chest aching. I swear it felt like we'd stolen back five, maybe even ten degrees. And on a night like this, that's the difference between shivering all night and finally feeling your hands again. The Plains tribes knew this. Archaeologists have found lodge sites with dugout centers. They weren't wasting time. They were channeling cold where it belonged. Smart folks way ahead of us. And sitting there watching our breath fog up, but not choke us, I'll tell you. It felt like the first little victory. The kind of win that makes you grin through cracked lips and say, All right, maybe we've got a shot tonight. But don't get too comfortable, guys. Keeping your backside off ice is one thing. Stopping the ground from stealing every ounce of heat, that's the next battle. And that's where trick number two comes in. The ground. It'll rob you blind. Doesn't matter if you're sitting pretty or tough as nails, when the frost creeps up through your back, it'll drain the heat right out of you. That's why the old tribes covered the earth with buffalo hides, thick, heavy, warm, a barrier between bone and frozen dirt. We didn't have buffalo. What we had was a pile of dry straw and a couple of ragged hides. Not pretty, not perfect, but in survival, you use what you've got. We spread the straw first layer after layer, like we were thatching a roof. Only this roof was under our feet. Then we threw the hides over the top. Instant floor. Primitive insulation. And let me tell you guys, the change was night and day. No more icy bites seeping into the spine. When we leaned back, it wasn't bone against ice anymore. It was like lying on a rough mattress that actually fought for you, not against you. I swear within minutes, our backs felt human again. You could almost forget the snowstorm hammering outside. That's the mini victory. That's when you breathe out and say, okay, we're not losing this fight just yet. The Sioux, the Cree, the Cheyenne, they all knew this. 
Archaeologists have found layers of grass and hides in ancient lodges. They weren't making things pretty. They were making them livable. But don't think the floor was our only enemy. The wind. The wind is a thief. It snakes in, steals every bit of warmth you thought you had, and that's where trick number three comes into play. The floor was no longer stealing our heat, but the wind. The wind was relentless. It came crawling under the canvas, sharp as broken glass. Every draft felt like a thief reaching in to grab whatever warmth we'd managed to hang on to. So we turn to the next trick, snow insulation. Sounds crazy, right? Using snow to keep warm. But snow, it's not just frozen water. It's nature's fiberglass. Tiny pockets of trapped air make it one of the best insulators out there. We shoveled the drifted snow up against the base of the tippy, packed it tight, banked it high. Before long, we'd built ourselves a hybrid half tippy, half igloo, primitive engineering at its finest. And you know what? It worked. The drafts stopped. That bone-cutting wind had nowhere to slip through. Inside, the air settled, quieter, still bitter, but no longer slicing us apart. Guys, it felt like throwing a blanket around the whole lodge. A crude frozen blanket, sure, but one that kept us from shivering every time the storm howled. The Inuit perfected this with igloos. Northern tribes did it with packed snow walls. We were just borrowing a page from the old playbook, sitting there listening to the wind rage and realizing it couldn't touch us. That was another little victory, another moment where you whisper to yourself, all right, we're still in this fight, but the cold has more than one weapon. The wind was tamed, yes. Yet our bodies still ached for real heat, which brought us to trick number four, and a method older than the frontier itself. By now, we'd beaten the floor and we'd beaten the wind, but our bodies still craved one thing, real heat. And that's where the old trick comes in. Heated stones. Long before frontier men, long before steel stoves, tribes and trappers would heat rocks in a fire, then bury them under hides or earth. Those stones turned into batteries of warmth, silent fireplaces radiating heat long after the flames were gone. Now we didn't have a fire. This was a simulation, a test. So we preheated a pile of stones outside, then dragged them in, wrapped in canvas, tucked them under layers of dirt and hide. No sparks, no smoke, no flame inside the tippy, just glowing heat locked in stone. And the effect was unreal. Hours later, you could still feel the soft pulse of warmth rising up from the floor. Not blazing hot, not campfire cozy, but steady, reliable. Like a heartbeat under the ground, keeping the cold at bay. Guys, I'll be honest. Sliding my hands over those hides and feeling that warmth creep into my bones. It was like finding treasure in the middle of a frozen desert. The Romans did this with hypocaust floors. The Sioux used river stones. Same principle. Heat the stone, let it give back what it's stolen. That night, it bought us precious hours of sleep. The kind of warmth that lets you unclench your jaw, stop shivering, and actually rest. But here's the thing. Stones don't last forever. By dawn, they cool. And when they cool, the fight begins all over again. That's why we needed trick number five. Something that depended not on the earth but on the skin on our backs. Here's the truth, fellas. Clothes can save you, or they can kill you. At 20 below, wet fabric is a death sentence. Doesn't matter if you've got 10 layers. If that base layer's damp, the cold will crawl inside and eat you alive from the core. So we tested it. Halfway through the night, our liners were damp with sweat. Not much, just enough to feel clammy. And that clammy turns into freezing faster than you think. We stripped off the wet, swapped into a dry layer, thin wool, nothing fancy. And instantly, the difference hit. Instead of shivers working their way from chest to spine, the body started holding its heat again. It was like plugging a leak in a boat. You stop the water, you stop the sinking. Guys, I've slept in plenty of cold camps. I'll tell you this, staying dry beats piling on three more jackets. Every time. The old hunters knew it. The Cree carried spare moccasin liners. The trappers dried socks by the fire like their lives depended on it because they did. That night with dry wool hugging the skin, the cold stopped gnawing from the inside. 
It didn't vanish, but it backed off, enough that we could unclench our shoulders and breathe like men, not icicles. Another small victory, another reminder that survival isn't about how much you carry, it's about what you keep dry. But even with dry clothes and warm stones, sometimes you need more than your own body to fight the freeze. And that's where trick number six took us into an old practice that made the difference between life and death on countless winter nights. By this point, we'd beaten the floor, we'd beaten the wind, and we'd wrung the damp out of our clothes. But the cold still had one card left. It was in the air itself. And when the air won't warm up, you turn to the oldest furnace known to man each other. Hunters and trappers knew this. Out on the trap line, when the firewood ran out, they'd roll themselves together under a single buffalo hide. No shame in it. Just survival. So we tried the modern version. Two sleeping bags zipped together into one big cocoon. Side by side, shoulder to shoulder. At first, it felt a little awkward, like sardines in a can, but then... Then the science kicked in, each of us pumping out 98.6 degrees. Add them together, and suddenly that tippy felt less like a meat locker and more like a living furnace. A human stove, steady and sure. Within minutes, the shivers eased. The frost on the inside canvas stopped creeping down. Our breath no longer felt like knives, it felt like steam. Guys, I've slept alone in the cold, and I've slept packed tight with a hunting buddy. I'll take the buddy. Pride won't keep you warm, but shared body heat just might keep you alive. That night, huddled together, we weren't just two men in a storm. We were a furnace burning back the freeze. But even a furnace needs walls. And the final trick, the reflective barrier, was the thing that made our tippy feel less like a frozen shelter and more like a proper winter cabin. By the time we hit trick seven, we had the floor handled, the wind blocked the clothes dry, and the bodies huddled. But one thing was still leaking our own heat. It kept bleeding out through the canvas like smoke through a torn chimney. That's where the reflective barrier came in. Today, you'd call it a mylar blanket, shiny, crinkly, cheap as chips. But the principle is old. Tribes once used pale bark or hide scraped light to bounce firelight back inside their lodges. Same thinking, different material. So we tacked silver sheets along the inner walls of the tippy. They flapped in the lantern glow, looked almost silly, like we'd wrapped the place in tinfoil. But 20 minutes later, we felt it. The air itself changed. No, it wasn't cozy, but it was warmer. Noticeably warmer. Guys, I'll tell you, after hours of fighting cold, even a five-degree edge feels like striking gold. It was like putting a lid on the pot. Suddenly, the heat wasn't escaping. It was circling, wrapping back around us. The ancients knew the rule waste nothing. Reflect what you've got. That silver shine was the final layer, the last shield. And for the first time that night... The teepee felt less like a desperate shelter and more like a winter cabin we could actually call home. Morning came and the score was clear. The cold pit and snow wall rock solid. The hides and straw saved our backs. Heated stones worth their weight. Shared body heat. Awkward, sure, but it worked. Reflective barrier cheap, but it turned the tippy into a cabin. Which trick won the night? None of them. The truth, guys, it was the stack. One layer on the floor, one layer on the wall, one layer on the skin. Together they built a shield. Our ancestors didn't always have firewood, but they had wits. And that more than anything is what kept them alive and kept us breathing till dawn. So there we were, two men, a teepee and a storm. Outside the wind howled like wolves. Inside our breath rose in little clouds of steam but it was warm enough to sleep. If you found something useful here, tuck it away. Winter's coming, and when it does, you'll want a few of these tricks in your back pocket. Survival isn't about beating the cold, it's about making peace with it. A 20 degree if night won't kill a man, if he knows how to treat the cold like a hard, demanding friend.